Welcome to Big Business This Week. I'm J.D. Durkin here on the trading floor of the New York Stock Exchange. As always, one and all, no shortage of busy headlines in the world of business, the economy, artificial intelligence, and beyond to get into. We'll be talking about a multi-billion dollar chip deal with Broadcom and OpenAI, plus AI's new partnership with Walmart, how it could change the future of how you shop. Lots of tech upgrades to talk about as well. Who better to chat with than longtime friend of ours here at Cheddar, Ray Wong. He's founder and principal analyst of Constellation Research and co-founder of the AI Forum. My man, welcome back. Nice to have you. Hey, thanks for having me. What an exciting week. You're not kidding. Well, let's let's before we dive into any of the more AI specific deals and the news going on, let me get your sense on the markets. We had a really notable sell-off late in the week last week. We're in the heart now, once again, of earnings season. We've heard from the banks, but a bit of nervousness, maybe from some regional bank names. It's putting downward pressure on the markets today and later on this trading week. What are you seeing in the markets more broadly, Ray? Well, here's the thing. In the absence of any data with a government shutdown, no one knows what's really going on other than, hey, there's a lot of AI hype. But the bottom line is the numbers are showing. We are in earnings seasons, and the bottom line is the tech companies are delivering, the banks are delivering, and of course, we're about to see a whole bunch of other sectors deliver. And that completely blows everyone's mind that the economy is still doing as well as it is uh, in terms of where we are today. Ray, how are you approaching the kind of broader so-called AI bubble debates, not to take away from the substance of the actual deals themselves, but man, you look at these valuations, you look at their forward-looking PE multiples for a lot of the stocks, they're they're pretty elevated. Well, there are a lot of plays here. And I think if you would if you think that there's a bubble, you have to go back and look at the macros. A artificial intelligence, intelligence, so AI intelligence is doubling every six to seven months. And that means we're going to need compute power. We're going to need energy. We're not even done. We're going to need lots of gigawatts of capacity. So if you think about what the overall capacity that's needed, we're basically at 20 to 30% of where we need to go. So from that perspective, there isn't a bubble. But the second piece is where the revenue is coming from and are the revenues making some impact? While you see a lot of studies that are showing that, hey, these AI projects aren't necessarily turning out. Out, those were POCs that didn't have the right foundation. And when we look at companies that are actually le leading in AI, they're actually pulling ahead. And so you're starting to see that. And it could be anything from an Uber to a Walmart. These companies are actually pushing the limits in terms of their industries and where AI is about to head. Take United Healthcare in AI, take Walmart in AI, take JP Morgan in AI. These are companies that are in the lead. Is there any company or sector that's not going to try tie itself to AI. I remember earnings earnings seasons of the last couple of years, you end up counting how many of the S&P 500 companies are mentioning AI in their earnings calls. Is every company to some degree or another kind of an AI play in this ecosystem? Yes and no. People are going to use AI to cut costs. People are going to use AI to make regulatory compliance and reduce risk. But the companies that are building AI into their business models, we see them winning 10 to 1. And for example, like I was talking about Uber later, like, you know, what happens? Well, Uber basically had a situation where they were going to run out of drivers. You can either raise prices or you can get more people into each car. They used their ML AI foundation from 10 years ago to drive that ability to do ride sharing, dynamic pricing, and also better logistics in terms of how the routes are optimized. That's the kind of thing. You have to build AI into your business model and you have to build it early. Yeah, we talk about AI. You're not going to go very far on Wall Street without talking about open AI and Sam Ullman specifically. A lot of deals that the company has been making. Let's start first and foremost with what's top of mind for you with regards to the new multi-billion dollar chip deal announced between open AI and AVGO, the team at Broadcom. Yeah, you know, the beauty of what OpenAI is doing is they're hitting up everybody for compute capacity. What they've realized, and I think competitors are starting to understand OpenAI's strategy, is that they know this is a winner-takes-all market. So you take the chips, you take the companies, you take the deals, and you take the investment capital. They're going all out on all four of those. And what they're trying to do is completely get all their sourcing and their supply chains in place. What's the supply chain? It's about getting chips. What is their sourcing? They're getting all the deals. They were just in Asia Pacific going to every company make asking them to invest or become partners i mean they're basically systematically going out and raising funds they might not need the money but what they're doing is they're taking the money off the table for everyone else how do you think a deal like this supports open ai's ongoing ai hardware ambitions 
well, here's the thing. We don't know exactly which chip companies are going to make it, which chip companies are going to have the right valuations. We're doing GPUs today. We're going to go to TPUs in the future, and we're going to hit the quantum. And the question is, you've got to look at all options. So this is kind of like, do you bet on winds, solar? Do you bet on hydro? Do you bet on gas-fired carbon? Uh, the point is, you go all of the above, and that's what OpenAI seems to be doing. How do you think the partnership, with, at least what was announced between OpenAI and Broadcom, how does that impact NVIDIA's? ongoing dominance in the general AI chip space, if at all? Well, just like the agreements with AMD, just like agreements with Broadcom and other places, the bottom line is we have CPU capacity, we have inference, we have training, all those areas people are going after. And basically you've got to have the capacity to hit every one of those. Once we get through the training, it's all going to be inference and reasoning, uh, and that's going to be the next level. And you can start seeing the way that OpenAI is making partnerships and investments. They're heading that way. It's the same strategy NVIDIA has been doing as well as they've been building out their ecosystem. Those two companies have some of the strongest alliance and partnerships partner teams out there. When you look at the broader AI race, who are the leaders in your opinion? Are, are, is it the, the household names we talk a lot about or are there some other names maybe a bit more under the surface you think are deserving, if not to the crown of the AI leaders, but who could be positioning themselves to have the crown tomorrow? Well, you know, Google's been like rolled out a lot and we actually thought Google was in the lead in the beginning. And I think don't take, don't rule Google out. Um, I think we also have a whole layer, as I was telling you about earlier, an agentic AI war coming, right? And these are companies that are taking it to the next level. We have the chips, we have the hyperscalers, and then we have the apps. And this is ServiceNow, Salesforce, Oracle, Workday, uh, companies that are not public like Boomi. These are companies that are basically building the next agentic enterprise layer. And they're basically doing cross platform multi-agentic capabilities, which means you can take an agent and use it in any one of your apps across any one of your departments. Well, speaking of using an, an AI agent across departments, Walmart within the last day announcing that it's set to partner with OpenAI to offer shopping on ChatGPT. What do you make of an announcement like that? Does that help in theory Walmart's ongoing customer experience? You have to choose anyone but Google or Amazon if you're Walmart, right? And so you have to actually choose a broader set of options. And what's going on at Walmart is Walmart's becoming more and more like a tech company like Amazon every day. What do they have? They over like 300 million shoppers, right? That's users that can actually access the network. They have a data set that allows them to do digital advertising and commerce, both in the physical and digital world. That is a lot of information and insights. And today you have one search engine that dominates everything, Google. Well, in the future, every LLM is going to be that search engine and that's prepping for the war. You're going to open AI, you're going to Anthropic, you're going to Perplexity. Uh, and of course, that means you have to have all sets of options. It's a brilliant move by Walmart to get in early with an LLM that's going to be more than an LLM. It's going to be a browser. It's going to be your operating system. It's going to be your ad network. It's going to be enterprise apps. Open AI has really big ambitions. Yeah, you ain't exactly where I want to ask you next. What, what is your, what do you envision ChatGPT ultimately will become? Because I think by the time you and I are having this conversation, mid-October 2025, most if not everyone has played around with ChatGPT as an LLM, maybe helped us with some administrative tasks, questions, whatever it is. But you're talking about a fundamental rethinking of what right now is still a relatively nascent technology. So tell me more about how you think maybe the average user will be interacting with ChatGPT in the future. You know, we're going to get to about a billion users pretty soon, maybe by the end of the year on ChatGPT. But more importantly, we're going to get to a point where your GPT actually understands you your personal preferences. So maybe you have your personal shopper or an advisor or someone that's watching out for your health or giving you reminders. Um, you're going to be walking in and you know you realize that you're in a meeting and you're prepped for notes and all the information and insights and background materials are over, are there and delivered to you. You're going to actually walk into a store and say, oh, I, this was on my shopping list and grocery list. I didn't think about that. You know what? I already bought that. Oh, wait, I have five of these already. Oh, wait, no, I'm missing three. That's the kind of usage. It's these ambient experiences that are going to pop out and that's what we're going to see in this world of ai has there been any type of rollout of ai already that has surprised you or any technology or feature of these llms you were not expecting 
to already be as successful as they are? Or are we, for the most part, following the trajectory that you expected them to? Can't predict the trajectory, but I can tell you that people are using it in amazing ways. Um, anything from music production to creativity. I mean, it's taking companies that would have taken six months for a global marketing campaign. They can down it to six weeks. And I've heard even six days, language translation, regulatory requirements, all the kind of things that you need in every country for a global launch. We had a friend at a company called Soul of the Machine.ai. They beat out a large SI who put 140 people and 12 months on a project to rewrite an entire system. They bid 10 people six months, then they deliver it in three months for half the cost. I mean, that's the scale we're talking about in coding, right? We're seeing it also in terms of like fraud and fraud management, the ability to stop crime, stop fraud efforts, um, being able to hit that. I mean, what might've taken you like an hour to track down um, a fraudulent activity is now happening in milliseconds. I mean, it's all over the place. Well, speaking of one of the many tech giants, somewhat leaning into AI uh, is Apple. Now, Apple shares are down fractionally, and they're having a tough day on Wall Street today, down more than a full percent. Uh, but one of the many news-making items surrounding Apple, Ray, is the new M5 chip upgrade in various Apple products. Give me your take when you hear that type of announcement. What more do you think it can do that the current iteration of hardware tech does not allow Apple, and therefore Apple's users, to take advantage of? I think the most important thing to realize is AI is going to move to the edges. And when you have 3 billion parameters sitting right here, right, you have so much power at the edges to be able to do things to start the process of situational awareness. The M5 chips, the way they've been built, right? You have your GPUs, your TPUs, your memory, your architecture. It's probably one of the most powerful chips. I mean, there's a reason they stopped using Intel. There's a reason they stopped using other people because you actually have to design specialty chips for usage. So I think with the M5 chip, that's what you're getting is you're going to start seeing that price cost value curve come down. And more importantly, price costs come down, the value go up. But most importantly, um, that's what you're getting as as basically, you know, there's a battle for edge AI and Apple's going to be one of the winners in edge AI. Ray, was that the 17 Pro? That is the 17 Pro. That's, uh, yeah, your, that's how you know. Your take on, uh, can I get your take on how you're enjoying it so far? Because I know more than a few people who have said, I'm in the upgrade cycle. I just haven't done it yet, but I've seen all the commercials. What do you make of what you've seen so far? You know, it's very intuitive. If you like transparency and you like that model, it's great. If you want to go back to the old model, some people do that because they're used to where everything is, but it's all the little nudges. It's the ambient experiences, the reminders, the ability to take stuff in an image, capture it, bring it back or remind you. The search is so much better. It remembers where things are. I can say, hey, when was the last time I was at the New York Stock Exchange on Cheddar, right? And I'll pull it all up, right? It reads everything in the image, captures it, sorts it, creates ontologies and then builds against that. Uh, we try different voices on Siri and it's kind of fun. I'll create accents, sound like a Singaporean English or British English or Australian English. It captures those as well. I have a good friend that is German, grew up in it Italy, tries to speak English. Nothing captures what they're saying, but you know, they're able to pick that up. I mean, these are the kind of things that you're seeing, uh, I mean, that you couldn't do before. Yeah, maybe many ways to make cross-border communication a little bit easier than it's ever been before. Uh, speaking of and Apple, the translation, the yeah, translation is yeah, yeah. awesome. I was going to say, tell me more about the translation. How, how does it work the, in, in practice? The in-your Spanish translation is works. Spanish works great. I haven't tried the other languages yet, um, but it is amazing to be able to hear it. And you know what? We're getting closer to the universal translator, right? I mean, we're building to the Star Trek roadmap, and that's what Apple's been doing for a while. And I guess they're trying to avoid the Black Mirror roadmap is really what's going on here. The writers of the original Rosetta Stone would never have imagined how far technology would come by the end of the year 2025. Uh, Apple also in the headlines, according to reports from Bloomberg, rumored to be launching new home devices. Easy to look at this and say it's a direct challenge to like an Alexa device or something else you'd get from an Amazon or a Google. Um, what do you make of Apple's ambitions more and more into smart home devices? I feel like we're so beyond the, the early iteration of IoT, Internet of Things, and these companies want a piece of all parts of our lives. 
Well, you know, we uh, there's HomeKit's been around for a while and and that automation. And so I think what Apple's realizing is they, when they made the decision not to get into vehicles because they saw the price curve continue to come down, they realized like, what are the places where you're going to, you know, enrich your lives or what are these areas that are going to be important? Car was important, but the home is even more important. And that automation is only going to continue. So if you have trust in a company, I'd say people trust Apple more than any other tech company. You can, pro you can, pro you can play in health. You can play in the home and you can play in other areas that are very intimate to your lives because you trust them with their data. If there's one thing at the end of the day, you know, you've put the name Apple in front of all the other tech giants, Apple still wins on trust. Now on the HomeKit side, we're seeing a lot of interest in home automation, whether it's for saving energy, whether it's energy management, whether it's your ability to get your sound systems and your music in the way you want, the video that's coming up. It's anything from lighting, shading. They've been around for a while and there is a battle, but the problem is there are at least five or six different standards that people are are using, and that's what makes it a very messy market. It's up to Apple to make that standard uh, in a way that's easy to use for everyone else. Yeah, right before I let you go, I always like to ask our guests, name me one story, something you're thinking about. It can be personal finance, the economy, the broader market or tech, something you think we should be paying a little bit more attention to and talking a little bit more about, Ray, what would that be? The energy advantage that China has over us. That is the number worry, one worry you should be thinking about. If China can get energy at seven and a half to eight cents a kilowatt hour, and we're sitting at 16 to 17 cents, and Europe is at 25 cents, that is a very short war if you want to get into a trade war, a kinetic war, or anything else. We have got to get our energy costs down if we want to be able to play. This is a game about gigawatts. This is not a game about anything else. And if you can get the sustainability on energy, even better. But right now, we're not even close to competing. Wow. Uh, fascinating interview. Thank you, as always, for taking the time to be a guest. You're always welcome back here on Big Business This Week. That's Ray Wong, founder and principal analyst of Constellation Research and a co-founder of the AI Forum. Ray, come back again soon, my friend. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot.